slavery had a major political impact. We must remember that slavery is a product of what initially appeared to be innocent. The very first interactions between the enslavers and those who ended up being enslaved was a relationship of equals. These were representatives of a foreign power. Individuals such as Vasco da Gama were representatives of a foreign power and even earlier ones, and they were meeting kings and entering into contracts. So if you went to West Africa, there were organized communities amongst the Asante people, amongst the Ga, amongst the Temne, amongst the Mende, amongst the Yoruba. There were organized communities with complete with a political system. The same was also true in East Africa. They had people who had complete systems, uh, the Monomotapa Empire, the Zulu, uh, the Kosa had complete systems in Southern Africa and in East Africa we had the Bunyoro Kitara Empire, you had the Toro Empire, you had the Baganda Empire and even those which did not have empires like the Maasai and all other organizations, they were organized. In the Congo, they were the Bakongo were completely organized, the Ovambo and the Ovumbundu, all these were organized peoples. So when slavery came, and slave trade started in earnest. One of the things that those who are involved in slave trade did was to dismantle these powers and to dismantle the political structures and to create enmity amongst the people so that ethnicities or nations started rising against nations. You'll see this quite evidently in the history and the relationship between the Mende and the Temne in Sierra Leone. When these powers were now creating a culture of divide and rule, and when they had caused animosity, then of course they destroyed your political structure and started imposing their own political structures. And that is why you see that slavery is, uh, the immediate successor of slavery is colonization. But even before colonization, when slavery ended, the companies that were involved in slavery are the ones which came in advance. So you had religion, of course, coming. You had companies coming like the Imperial British East African Company. And then you had administrators coming. And when the administrators coming, you now hear that what was this initially a kingdom now becomes a protectorate of the British Empire or a protectorate of some European powers. And then, of course, the European powers also started struggling amongst themselves because it's no longer only slavery that is being talked about. You are now using the slave also to carry other commodities. You enslave the slave, those whom you have transported, you have taken them to the Caribbean or to the United States of America or to Europe, but there are others that you also retain on the ground to be the carriers of gold and copper and iron ore and other minerals. So you need a political system which you can control. So politically, Slavery was the beginning of the dismantling of African political organizations and the dismantling of African organized governance structures. The impact was heavy. We have never recovered from it. And I say this by when I, um, I mean that the immediate successor of slavery was colonization. And after that, of course, we know that its immediate successor was neocolonization. The impact of slavery is alive and well today. In, why, in fact, it can be said, and I'm saying it, that neocolonization is a product of slavery. And I'm saying it, that slavery was neocolonization in its embryonic stage. If you understand it in that way, the impact is alive and with us here and now. And remember, slavery has not 
completely gone. We may have abolished slavery and slave trade in the 1860s, in, but remember that slavery is still alive and well, both in its crude form and in much more sophisticated forms as we speak today. We still, in fact, do have kingdoms. We do have kingdoms which are thriving and well organized in Ghana, in Nigeria, in Malawi, in different, in uh, Liberia, in Uganda, in many parts of Africa, in Southern Africa, in Eastern Africa. We still have kingdoms. But I hold the view that if African kingdoms and or other systems of governance were not interrupted, they would have evolved in a possibly totally different way from what we now see. Many of the kingdoms that we now have have been infused with systems of governance which are alien, and to that extent, they have not grown in the manner in which they would have grown, with the consequence that they do not perform the role that they ought to perform because they are also laboring under systems of governments or governance which are alien. So you would have the Zulu kingdom in, in, in the South African state in a governance system which is European. You'd have the Buganda kingdom or the Bunyoro Kintara kingdom or the Toro kingdom, but within the state of Uganda. You'd have the Asante kingdom which is in the state of Ghana. You would have the Yoruba kingdom, which is within the state of Nigeria. So you can see that all these are laboring and are suffocated by alien systems. And this is courtesy of what started as slavery, the domination of one culture by another. Oh, culture, that is the greatest impact. And whenever I look at the cultural impact of slavery, I always remember the book written by Nigeria's Chinua Achebe in 1958, Things Fall Apart, when he laments and says that the white man came and he broke the things that held us together and things have fallen apart. And things did, did in fact fall apart and have remained in that state for a very long time. Look at culture. Look at the names that we now bear. Europeans came complete with slavery and complete with religion and told us that if you wanted God to receive you in heaven, you ha must have a Christian name called John or Jane or Patrick, or Patricia. So they took away our names. They told us that our God was not God, yet it was only one God, it was the same God that we were worshiping. So they told us that that was witchcraft, and they took it away. They came and told us that our ways, all our ways were heathen, and they destroyed them. They came and told us that our languages were not good and that we must speak their tongue and we continue to speak their tongue and look down upon our own tongues. The culture, the way we, our foods were also considered to be below what was expected, everything. Our style of dressing, if there is a single thing that contributed to the dehumanization of the African peoples, it was slavery and slave trade. If you go to other parts of the world where the African diaspora is, to the United States of America, to the Caribbean, it is now that they are struggling through DNA and science to find out where did I come from? You did not even know where you came from. And if you look at Alex Haley's dramatization of this phenomena in the film that is called Roots, where he talks about Kunte, who was taken away from Jufre village in the Gambia, you see even in the dramatization how traumatizing it was, how painful it was, how, do, how the umbilical cord between you and your people was cut 
the impact was huge and the cultural impact is alive and well today. You know, there's a saying in the Kiswahili language that he or she who does not have culture is a slave. And I think the cultural dislocation is one of the most devastating impacts that slavery and slave trade have had on the continent of Africa. And this is documented and it is something that has led to a miseducation as a people. It has led to this low self-esteem that people have and the impact is debilitating and dehumanizing, dehumanizing and humiliating at once. In Greek history, there is something called the Trojan horse. When the enslaver came, it all looked very innocent. And one of the things that you see across Africa, which is a good attribute, but which is part of the African weakness, we welcome everybody. We believe that everybody has good intentions. And because of that inclination of the African to welcome everybody and anybody without questioning, we have paid dearly for it. We as Africans have lost our land because we trusted too much. We Africans have lost our culture because we trusted too much. We have lost and continue to lose our resources because we trust too much. But those who come to Africa, nine out of 10 times know what they want. So they come with fists of iron clothed in velvet. And we only realize it too late. So it was not our fault. It is never our fault to be good. It was their fault that they abused our trust. But we also have a duty. Having been abused in that manner, having been dehumanized in that manner, the time is now for the scales on our eyes to fall. The time is now for the wax in our ears to melt so that even when we embrace people and accept them as visitors, we must always do so in the knowledge that not that which looks good is always good. There is an English saying, all that glitters is not gold. So we must know that sometimes bronze pretends to be gold. It is our duty to discover that. You know, we don't talk about Congo as we should. When Leopold of the Belgians went to Congo, he found a society that was organized in the middle of one of the richest places God ever created. And he claimed Congo as his personal property. This we never say. Initially, what is now Congo, which later became a colony of Belgium, was claimed by King Leopold II of Belgium as his personal property. And at that time, of course, they were doing many things, including rubber. And it is not said, as we should, that King Leopold killed no, more, no less than 13 million Congolese twice the number of those who were killed in the Holocaust. He did that. And he discovered one thing, that in order to subdue the Congolese, you must divide them. You must tell them you are the Bangala, you are the Waluba, you are the Bakongo. So he sowed the seeds of discord amongst them. And those seeds have remained alive today. So from slavery to the Berlin Conference, where they now agree to divide the continent of Africa, Congo was debilitated. Remember that what we now call the Democratic Republic of Congo is the size of the entire Western Europe. From Portugal to Austria in terms of size. 
and has resources which some have described as scandalous, that how could God in his divine wisdom put so many things in a single place? If it is the forest, they are there. If it is minerals, they are there. But slavery and slave trade ensured that those people were dehumanized, those people were disorganized, and they remain disorganized even as I speak. Because disorganization allows for exploitation. And that exploitation is going on as I speak. As I speak, the busiest airspace in the continent of Africa is Eastern Congo. The continuation of slavery and suffering because European powers continue to exploit that place. And there is modern day slavery in that part. The mine workers are modern day slaves. They may receive wages, but just that is just for purposes of keeping them alive that they may continue to work the mines. And that is why you saw Congo also produce some spiritualists who wanted to protest against all these. Donna Beatrice, Kimpa Vita, Simon Kimbangu came out of that environment saying, this slavery, and you've enslaved us twice. You've enslaved us through religion. You've enslaved us physically. You've enslaved us through colonization. We must have a new awakening. So Congo is a painful place to watch. So rich, yet so poor. There is that debate that, as we know, when the Portuguese came for the first time in the 14th or to the 15th century, the relationship was one of equals. And the Congo, the Congo Empire was organized, and there were these Portuguese who were looking for, as I've said, gold, and they were looking for spies and any other thing. The Congo were already an organized empire and they had relationship. They had wars with other communities. They had war with the Waluba and other communities and they had prisoners. And of course, they did not know what to do with them. So that is how they started using them as porters to take things to the coast. And that is how you see slavery started emerging in that particular and redefining the relationship. And when, of course, they were no longer slaves who were obtained through war, people started raiding for slaves. You now were raiding other communities for purposes of enslaving them. So while one can say that there was a contribution by elements within the African communities, the upscaling of slavery to the level that then became known as the transatlantic trade and the triangle is one for which the European powers must be blamed. Because having recognized this, that this was improper, they perpetuated it. So it is true to say that there were elements within the African communities who participated quite intimately in slave trade. And indeed, African chiefs have apologized in this regard. They have said, we made a contribution to this particular process, but if you want to apportion blame, our blame cannot be more than 20%. The blame must be largely to the European powers who now made it into a science, if you may. The European powers converted what was a low level activity within the continent of Africa and converted into a science. And that science is a science which visited and continues to visit untold pain to the African peoples. When one is talking about slavery, it's also important to say that while we have this marker called the 15th century as the beginning of slavery as we know it, these, these are dates which, which keep their moving target. On the western coast of Africa, it is documented that it started in earnest in the 15th century. But it must be remembered, as we said a little earlier, that when we talk about slavery, it is something that started many years before. And it is true that some of aspects of slavery were not even documented. 
And slavery on the eastern coast, it is now documented that it may have started as early as A.D. 650. A.D. 650. It must have started even much earlier than that. So when we talk about the history of slavery, we must also remember that there are a lot of historical gaps in terms of documentation. But the ones that we now talk about are the ones that are documented and the ones that are more debil debilitating and the ones whose effects was a lot more vicious. That is why we mentioned them. And because the European uh, enslavers and those who later became abolitionists were documenting a lot better than everybody else, we forget those which were not documented. But the truth be told, slavery was alive and well in the eastern part of Africa, courtesy of Arabs and their, uh, their, those who are uh, their acolytes within the African communities who were working with them to ensure that. There was a man who was uh, called Tipu Tip, who, and the Tipu Tip came out of the gun that he was using, who was running riot across what is now Tanzania and was enslaving people. And, and there was a man called Said Bagash, who came from the Omani Arabs, who was one of the lead in the latter days of slavery. Remember that slavery in its former sense in Zanzibar was until 1960. Until 1960, despite the fact that slavery had been abolished, slavery was continuing in Zanzibar until the revolution in 1964. So when we say that slavery was abolished, abolished, when we say that slavery was abolished or that slave trade was abolished, that, that was the formal pronouncement uh, that, that uh, was done. But when you look at the history of abolition in, uh, when we were in school, we were told about uh, George Wilberforce, who was himself uh, a parliamentarian, and when he was talking about abolition, he even said that he does not believe in the immediate emancipation of the slave, that they must be trained to be free. When uh, Abraham Lincoln is abolishing slavery in 1863, we know that slavery continued long after that. So slavery is not something that is easy to discuss as having started and stopped. It is not easy to say that slave trade started and stopped. I believe that like the chameleon, slavery has only changed color over the years. Changed color, but not character. You know, there is this thing that we now talk, and is in all civilizations. I was reading a book which is written about the culture of Japan, which is called Ikigai, which talks about you are because I am. I'm reading about the Christian Bible and it says you are your brother's keeper. You are reading about the traditions of people in Sumeria, which says take care of your brother. You are reading about the Hindu, the Mahabharata, which says you must always take care of those who are weak in the society. I'm reading about the African societies, and we now talk about the concept of Ubuntu, and we talk about you are because I am. If the human spirit could embrace the fact that the God that we worship or we know is a creator of diversity, then our humanity and humanness, if you may, would enable us to recognize that we may be different in terms of our complexion, we may be different in terms of our languages, but the God is a God of diversity. The birds of the air are different, they are big and small, but they don't enslave each other. It is only human beings. <laughs> it's, uh, maybe somebody will say, I do not know the language of the bird. But from what I see, we are supposed to be the most rational of all God's creation. But in truth, we are the most irrational of all God's creation. We are supposed to be the thinking or the thinkers of God's creation, and yet we are the ones who visit pain upon one another. Human beings are the only Creatures on earth who make nuclear bombs that they may kill one another. They are the only ones who make biological weapons that they may visit pain upon one another until the day that the human mind is purged of greed. 
will always harm one another. And the only way to do it is to embrace the spirit of Ubuntu. I am because you are, and you are because I am. If we do that, nobody will ever accept slavery. Nobody will ever enslave another. That is the direction in which we must move going forward. No more.